Welcome to Voices for Peace and Conservation. Join us in listening to inspiring stories from people who are working to save nature while also promoting peace. From the plains of northern Kenya to international conference rooms in Switzerland. Our guests will help us answer the question, how do we take care of nature and live in peace? My name is Hester Grunewald and I have worked on peace and conflict issues for many years. I will be your host for this podcast on behalf of four organizations who work on conservation and peace. They are Conservation International, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, Peace Nexus Foundation and the Worldwide Fund for Nature Germany. Our collective experience has convinced us that we need to work together much more closely as peacebuilding and conservation practitioners. Whether we are researchers, policymakers or activists, we all have a part to play. But how do we do this and what lessons can we learn from each other's work? Over the course of the coming episodes, we'll be exploring these questions with our guests. For more information, have a look at the podcast description notes. Voices for Peace and Conservation is produced by Impact with Joy. And now, enjoy the podcast. Over the course of this podcast, we've heard from many people and learned a lot about what it takes to save nature and live in peace. We've talked about conserving animals and habitats, responding to climate change and environmental security, and integrating the environment as part of peace processes. We've heard from the people doing this work around the world and the particular contributions of women and indigenous people. In this final episode, we're asking, where do we go from here? Where should we put our energy, time and money if we really want to make a difference? To help us answer these questions, we have three guests today. Our first guest is Hassan Molid Yassin, who is the Somali focal point for the African Youth Initiative on Climate Change and the vice chairperson of the youth-led Somali Greenpeace Association based in Mogadishu. Hassan has been working on educating people about the impacts of climate change and encouraging action to address this such as protecting and increasing plant and tree cover. We are also joined by Ulrika Orkeson, Lead Policy Specialist Environment and Climate Change, and Anna Orkelund, Lead Policy Specialist Peace and Security from the Swedish International Development Agency, also known as CEDA. Ulrika and Anna, in a way, illustrate exactly what we have been talking about during this series. Ulrika works on the environment and Anna works on peace but they have been making the case for these two perspectives to be much more closely integrated with each other and across Sweden's development cooperation initiatives. Welcome to all three of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hello. So Hassan, I would like to start with you. One thing that I find really interesting is that there are so many young people from Africa who have become very active in calling attention to climate change and in mobilizing others to take action. Why do you think this is the case? Uh, thank you for asking me this question. As we are all aware that uh, Africa is experiencing the impacts of climate change more than any other nations, uh, such as droughts, uh, floods, disasters, and shortage of food. And as a result of this one, young generations in Africa, since they make up of 70% of the population, they are the most uh, impacted people, they feel at the pain of climate change. That's why they are raising their voices to address climate change issues in the African continents and encouraging their leaders to take uh, effective actions to mitigate and adapt the climate change issues that's taking place in Africa. They also do encourage world leaders to take their responsibility and the pledge they have taken to reduce their carbon emissions below two degrees Celsius. Mm. And, uh, and you are the Somalia focal point for the African Youth Initiative on Climate Change. So what does this initiative do? Uh, African Youth Initiative on Climate Change is a youth-led uh, organization that works more than 40 countries in Africa to address climate change issues and environmental problems in Somalia. 
It brings diverse uh, people together to address on the impact of climate change in Africa as well as the world. They work on uh, in Somalia, uh, Kenya, Uganda, Zambia, uh, Ethiopia, and more other African countries. What they really do is a volunteering program to address the climate change issues. They bring uh, African leaders together, young people, both male and female, so that they will uh, bring or come up with a solution on what already is impacting them on climate change. They are really doing a great job in Africa that they need to be supported. Right? Mm. And it's really this this issue of the impacts already being felt in so many different countries in Africa. So people are really mobilizing around that and, and young people in particular. And then um, in the work of your own organization, the Somali Greenpeace Association, how are you seeing these links between climate change, the environment and peace play out at the community level where you work? Uh, thank you. Uh, Somali Greenpeace Association is a youth-led organization that was founded in 2019. Uh, and the main thing that was, well, which was founded was to address on climate change issues in Somalia, because Somalia being part of the East Africa, it also uh, felt the impact, such as frequent uh, flood, drought, uh, disaster, shortage of food, we'll find shortage of water. As a result of this one, people are really uh, struggling for the rich, rich resources that resulted as a impact of climate change. So when these little resources are being conflicted between the community, it results in uh, insecurity due to the shortage of food so that people are fighting for the little resources each one needs to have for his or her own uh, to survive it. And this brings other communities not to let go of it, but also struggle for it. And this is uh, something that is leading to insecurity in Somalia. Uh, in practical experience, uh, Somalia has been uh, facing on for climate change impact and security issues, uh, where the shortage of water has caused that people to fight for the uh, for the little source of water which was available. This one leading to insecurity issues. The other thing that we really experience is that during the drought seasons, food gets scarce, and when food gets scarce, people uh, try to struggle for the little food to retain each one, and the other one is to get that uh, little food. This one is leading in security in Somalia. The other practical uh, experience, just uh, one of our focal points in the north, the central part has supported to us that it is that one day that uh, uh, a man who was having a gun with his hand, he saw another man of bush, uh, uh, of farmer who was trying to cut down a tree, but he said, oh young, oh young man, do not, do not cut these trees it, because it is protecting us and our, our animals. But since the other one was not was ignorant about the importance of trees, he argued with the other person who was having the gun, and he tried uh, to attack the, uh, the knife with the person who was having the gun. Uh, unfortunately, uh, protecting himself, uh, the one who was having the gun shoot the man, uh, resulting in one death of the people. And he took this one, uh, and he did not run away and not, not leave the body there, but he took the body and took his family. He said, this is what happened. You can either jail me or you can uh, take uh, uh, the, uh, the compensation or you can either uh, uh, kill me. Uh, this is uh, one of the sad stories. Both the two people were uh, pushmen, but one was, uh, was uh, aware of the importance of the trees that the community has while the other one wanted to cut it for either charcoal or other purpose of use. So this is also which can uh, lead on security issues. Uh, mm -hmm. And there are other uh, sad stories that you'll find that people now, uh, as a result of climate change, uh, due to shortage of water, a young uh, female who had two children, they died due to shortage of water due to their areas. As a result, this is something that causes uh, insecurity. In fact, uh, life is good. Mm. Well, that sounds very serious. And then even when people talk about conservation, trying to, to conserve the trees, even that can cause conflict because of these different uses that people want to have for the, for the resources. And, um, and can you say, can you tell us a little bit more about what are the roles that are being played by men and women in the communities when they're trying to address these challenges? Uh, both men and women play an important role in addressing uh, climate change issues, like uh, especially our young generation, the youth, 
who are now have realized the impact of climate change because our old people they feel the impact but they they do not really know what is impacting them but this is uh, now we change the uh, uh, ha our hands together to say this is what's impacting you. We they go both the rural areas and the urban areas to address them uh, the flood that they are seeing now and then and the way they can adapt with it uh, by doing uh, educational programs uh, and such as planting trees. In fact, uh, one of the practical things that since we have started this program, both our young female and men are being are contacted with other communities so that they can also go to those communities and raise climate change issues and plant trees. It was just yesterday that uh, the youth leader in uh, Central Park, a place called in uh, Dusumre, uh, he contacted us and he wanted to plant some trees in those areas. And those three areas are uh, harsh conditioned areas with a lot of sun, but the trees are so scant. So due to our financial gaps, we could not uh, read them, but we promised that some of our focal points will read them, educate them, and if we can find fund for them, we will actually at least uh, plant some trees to those areas to mitigate both climate change and environmental impact. The other thing that the youth are doing now, they are coming together to address on food security, on how they can adapt with the flooding that takes place with the uh, shortage of water, how they can uh, use the new technology. In fact, now, now we need to bring about on this one the renewable source of energy, which can be a, play a, vi a vital role uh, in addressing some of these issues because energy is uh, something important. For example, they can use for uh, the well uh, for pumping using the solar energy instead of the electricity, which causes high. They can also use the other technology we call the uh, uh, dripping water to irrigate uh, farms instead of using mm. the other systems uh, or, or better on purely on the rainfall, which is quite sometimes might not be uh, good. The other mm. thing is that we are encouraging is uh, catchment methods of water uh, because since the rains come, sometimes you'll find that all the water that are fell down are being lost. And I was just inquiring, now we have been receiving, it's our monthly rainy seasons. I was asking some of the rulers, do you catch uh, the water, do you, do you catch the water? But since they are adapting to the urban model, they have stopped using, uh, catching these waters. You will find that water got stressed. But we encourage mm -hmm. them and both the focal points of those areas to adapt the old systems where each uh, house had its own uh, brack or its own storage for uh, the rainy water, which was also uh, a source of livelihood income. The last time I used to be, live in the urban area in far of the central part of Somalia. So this is an issue. People also are diverting from the uh, traditional part and going to the uh, modern uh, uh, rural urban part, which is also another negative issue because catchment of water is a very important one. Because I now live in the urban, when I found that the rain is, uh, water is touched, I at least have to uh, catch those water almost two jirgans or two barracks either to use for either for drinking and and for washing since it's a pure water from uh, the heaven, which is a very important for the normal life. Great. So it, it is really about um, adapting practices across the board and young people really playing that role of creating awareness, trying out things, doing some projects and, and really trying to, Im to implement some of these ideas. And so when you're doing all of this work, uh, how are you engaging with the government and what do you need governments to do to help you produce some of these ideas and reproduce some of these ideas and practices at a bigger scale? Uh, thank you for this. Somalia uh, government is a quite a weak government uh, in addressing climate change issues. But what we do is all the time engage them, uh, starting from the legalization of any uh, organization that is working in Somalia has to be registered in the federal uh, government of Somalia, which we have already done two years again, and now we are renewing our uh, new registration. There is also uh, the, pr the Prime Minister's office, which is responsible for environmental issues and climate change in Somalia. We always uh, contact them and report them to our work, what we are doing. They encourage us and they told us to keep on the work, the good work that you are doing. We are highly uh, contacted with the 
this person who's the directorate of climate change and environment, uh, he directly told us that they cannot fund us because in fact, they do not have the resources to do it, but what they can do is uh, endorse our work, uh, uh, encourage and invite us to their meetings and uh, listen to their work. In fact, uh, what they now did was uh, they gave us the draft that they made of the NDCs in Somalia, which was uh, quite good, although it was not addressing as much as we wanted on climate change issues because the f it was four pillars that was uh, focusing and the first third pillar or first three pillars was on almost security issues because on Somalia being uh, uh, in a conflict state it majorly focuses and prioritizes security rather than any other things but it was also a uh, wide component of something that this is on adaptation and mitigation programs and as we were now Somalia does not need mitigation but it needs on adaptation people to adapt on uh, what is ever going on because you'll find that uh, just yesterday the news was reporting uh, in your area that was a, which is a river and area uh, the river started to flood it and people are almost trying to be displaced this is mm -hmm. something that uh, the government needs to adapt and uh, this uh, even before we started this organization that area now which the flooding was reported I went there when I was uh, uh, assistant lecturer in one of the uh, colleges in those area and i i have seen that uh, on the river beds or uh, the river beds were almost coming full but people were not taking actions to cover those uh, uh, places where the river might get flooded and mm. i told them why the local authorities are not taking actions of the people because we can see these things will flood but they responded to me sometimes uh, these people cannot do it. I say they can't do it. Why? It's just need something small before it gets bad. And when I went, I came back from those mm. areas one month later, I have had the whole area flooded. And this is why we have taken these such actions to so this, uh, these things in either to take prior actions or to prevent things before it occurs. Yeah. The government is and, trying to space, but it's not fun. Okay, and, and, and sorry, Hassan, I also just wanted to ask you to tell us what is an NDC, so we're all clear on that. Yeah, National Determined Contributions. Okay, great. So there, are, there is some action, but uh, also not a lot of support uh, in resource terms, but support in political terms. And, uh, and maybe a, a last question for you, Hassan. Talking to the international community and, and people, you know, regionally in Africa, but also more internationally, what could they do to help support the efforts of people like yourself, your organization, and other youth activists in Africa? Uh, thank you. Uh, international communities, both uh, the African leaders and the world leaders, can take effective actions to support young youth-led organizations, such as by financing, by capacitating uh, the young itself to address climate changes, by, by bringing them to the table for negotiations. Uh, and this is something already now it has begun, but we need what has begun was already on negotiations and getting youth on the table because we have we have seen that youths, youth are taking front lines to address climate change issues, both Africa and the world. We are part of uh, uh, different international network organizations such as uh, YANGO, which is uh, uh, UNFCC, um, United Nations for Climate Change Convention, Youth-Led Constituency, uh, United Nations Environmental uh, Youth-Led uh, Constituency, which really talk it with the uh, UNEP environment. And this is now what, but what we have all agreed that it's not enough for only negotiations, but uh, leaders and uh, international collaborations should take uh, uh, actions to provide financial assistance for those youth-led organizations to run their projects, to do more things what they can do now. Because it was realized they are doing more things than what the government already is doing. And the governments are impressed with young people. Because in Africa, at the end, you will find all things are impacted. The vulnerable are young people. And it's them who are doing the great work. Mm. Excellent. That's a that's a great note to to end that on. Thank you very much, Hassan. Thank you. Ulrike, let me come to you next. Hassan has talked a lot about the work that is being done at the local levels, but also how these youth networks engage with government decision makers and other multilateral bodies. So from your experience working with the Swedish government, 
What do you see as the big environmental issues that the governments and the international community are paying attention to? And what is top of their environmental agenda at the moment? Well, I think Hassan managed to illustrate the big environmental issues earlier in an excellent way. Uh, but let me start with a description that I think shows the magnitude of things. Um, Christina Figueres, earlier Executive Secretary, uh, Secretary of the United Nations Framework uh, Convention on Climate Change, said recently that there is a COVID wave and behind that wave and larger than those two is the biodiversity crisis. And behind that, and 10 times higher than all of those, is the climate change crisis. And underlying all the waves is the inequality crisis. And I think that governments and business must turn around and focus on dealing with not just the first COVID wave, but the longer term crisis. And importantly, they need to join up in solutions. And uh, scientists agree that it is now, uh, during this decade, when we decide together not only our own reality, but the future of humanity. And because if we can not halve our emissions by half, 2030, compared to what we have now, uh, we and future generations will be so affected, and especially our partner countries, uh, by changes in our living environment that we have never experienced before. And I think governments are stepping up more and more, but there is a need to speed up. And it is now or never it has to happen. And more and more actors are talking about the need for transformative change, doing things differently to receive a shift to a low emission and climate resilience, nature positive, sustainable development and all that. But it is also a must for development cooperation to do this. And also a need to see how everything is interlinked, not the least what we will talk about today, how climate change and environmental degradation is linked to conflicts. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that dimension, Ulrika, because it really does create the sense of how all the systems connect, the environmental crisis, the health crisis, the continuing inequality across the world, and also in terms of, of gender inequality. Um, and do you think, from what you're hearing in the circles where you work, that the links between environmental degradation, climate, conflict, that all of this is well enough understood and being taken seriously? Or, or do you feel there's still more work to be done? I believe there is more work to be done. Uh, it's definitely picked up more and more, but not in, in to the extent that that would be needed, I think. Uh, and uh, among certain groups, it is definitely there. And I think especially we've come further when we talk about climate change and um uh, uh, particularly, but maybe not in the broader sense of environmental degradation and, and also biodiversity. So there's a lot more to be done there. Great. Um, and maybe, Anna, from your side, focusing on the peace and security elements, what do you see as the big priority issues that the world is paying attention to now on the policy agenda? Um, well, first of all, I think that uh, the COVID-19 uh, crisis is still crowding out other issues. Uh, initially framed as, as a health and economic crisis, I think a broader debate on, on its uh, wider socioeconomic impacts, including the impact on social cohesion and risk of civil unrest in crisis, is, has only now started to enter the mainstream. And as Ulrika said, we are in the midst of multiple crises. Um, the biodiversity crisis and the climate change crisis are so much bigger and more complex. And complex risks need comprehensive responses. So we need to be comprehensive in our response and work across our different thematic areas. Governments do recognize, but not enough, that there are connections between climate change and conflict. Uh, climate impacts can exacerbate structural vulnerabilities, such as political grievances, inequality, gender-based marginalization, food insecurity, and underemployment. And in societies that are directly dependent on natural resources with small margins and little resilience, an increased scarcity in those natural resources can lead to increased competition and a deterioration and loss of livelihoods. Uh, the, the risk that that in turn leads to insecurity and violence is, is higher in context with a history of conflict where there are no or weak institutions for conflict resolution, especially when there are inequalities between different groups and climate change and loss of biodiversity affects those groups differently. 
And it's not only about the effects of environmental changes in themselves, it's also about the effects brought about by the measures that we take to adapt and cope with or slow down climate change. Change management is not easy. When societies go through big changes, there will be clashes of interest that will need to be somehow reconciled. The other side of that coin, though, is that wise management of natural resources and access to water can be used as entry points for social cohesion in contexts where scarcity is a driver of tensions and conflict. Uh, we, we can make sure that we, we should make sure that our response to climate change and biodiversity loss strengthens social cohesion by encouraging cooperation across any pre existing divisions and fault lines in our different societies as well as across differences in, in the interest in relation to climate change adaptation. Um, we just heard from Hassan how he and other young people in Somalia and elsewhere are engaged in finding solutions to address climate change while also at the same time strengthening social cohesion. And I think it is true that youth are often the ones leading the way on this matter in Africa and elsewhere around the globe. An example of that is also the Fridays for Future initiative and I think that all listeners to this pod will know that that movement uh, began when Greta Thunberg and other young activists sat in front of the Swedish parliament every school day for three weeks to protest against the lack of action on climate crisis. Yeah, exactly. And uh, and I'm also just thinking about both of your roles because you have um, quite influential roles in terms of inputting policy ideas and, and evidence and um experiences from elsewhere in the world into Sweden's uh, policy framework. And so I'm, I'm wondering if you can give us a sense of how these different policy elements are finding a space in the, in Sweden's policy. So where does the, where do the environment and peace elements end up sitting? Are they in the same policies? Are they still spread across different policies? What, what does it look like? Shall I start? Yeah, I think, um, as, as Anna mentioned earlier, it's, it is important to go beyond climate change and include the broader natural resource dimension when talking security and environmental degradation hits poor people the most. And, uh, and we see that and we see that in our both policy uh, areas, uh, of course, from, from different uh, point of view. And I think we could do much more in, in terms of integrating um, uh, this within both our policy areas. Uh, so that that's just a short answer to that that maybe Anna want to fill in. Yeah, I think um, I would say, although cautiously, that there is a tendency to at least talk about the need to work across sectors now uh, internationally. Uh, the UN twin resolutions about sustaining peace, the Agenda 2030, including SDG 16, about peaceful, inclusive societies, and working across the the so-called humanitarian development peace nexus. Uh, all of these ep efforts are important in the peace building sector, but all of them also point to the need to work across sectors. Uh, but I say cautiously because uh, working in silos still predominates. We're not yet walking the talk. Yeah, no, and, and it remains challenging to, to do that cross-cutting thing and not overwhelm everyone with uh, multiple mainstreaming policies, I guess. Um, and I, I wanted to ask you, maybe Anna, you can, you can start, um, because we've heard about, you've mentioned also, we've heard from Hassan about the work that he's doing and that other young people are doing across the world, really, on these issues. And how do you think governments and international organizations could best support these efforts? And one way to support uh, the efforts is to support what they're trying to achieve. Uh, we all need to work together towards uh, slowing down, mitigating climate change effects. And we all need to do so in a way that supports peace and sustainable development. Uh, in order to do that, we need to invest in and scale up local solutions, uh, which includes stepping up efforts to involve young women and men and support youth-led organizations already engaged in this type of work. Being at the forefront of climate crisis, young people and young peace builders must be involved in the solutions to address climate-related security risks. International agreements are useful in this regard. In, in peace building, since the adoption of Security Council Resolution 2250, which is about youth, peace and security, CEDA has increased our efforts to support youth-led peace building initiatives that traditionally have 
challenges accessing funds. So that has led to an increase of targeted support to, to participation of young women and men in conflict resolution and peace building programming. What we also need to see is more work across as well. There's some of that and, and I think we will see more in the future. Yeah, no, it was just to fill in on, on that we have a, a youth in focus uh, for a very important event coming up next year in Stockholm and that, that's the Stockholm Plus 50 Uh And uh, as you know, maybe that Sweden has proposed to host a high-level UN meeting in Stockholm June 2022, and uh, 50 years since the pioneering Stockholm Conference on the Human Environment. And there, uh, it will focus on cross-cutting actions that are designed to reduce inequalities, but uh, especially the poor and vulnerable. But the role of youth is really put in focus here and uh, It will also be an opportunity, I think, to raise the interlinkages like climate, environment and conflict in, in that conference. That's great. And uh, we look forward to, to seeing what can be, what can be discussed in, in that forum. And so, Anna, maybe you can tell us a bit more about how you see gender equality um, or gender inequality, as the case may be, fit into this broader agenda around environment and peace. Because we also heard from other guests during the podcast about the particular roles that women play on environmental issues and also peace. And it would be interesting to hear also from your perspective how that's playing out in your work. Well, first of all, um, as you may know, this, this, the Swedish government pursues a feminist foreign policy, and that is based on the conviction that sustainable peace, um, security and development and environmental uh, uh, concerns or goals can never be achieved if half the world's population is excluded. So in general, there is a need to promote uh, gender equality. And in my field, um, we have seen um, a lot of engagement, uh, not least by civil society, in the women, peace and security agenda uh, these last two decades in particular. And, and they have been, uh, there have been successes, um, but also um, th that push is facing resistance um, and even, in, even a bit of a backlash. The, the backlash is against uh, sexual and reproductive health and rights and, and, and gender issues that are more general. So it's not specifically targeted at women, peace, security. But there, there is a need to, again, to join hands and to work cross-sectorally on, on those issues as well. And I think that in peace building, we have learned from, from this, from the women, peace, security agenda, the work around that, but and from uh, the work around youth, peace and security, Uh, and and from many other sources, we have learned a lot in, about the need for inclusive approaches uh, to peace building embedded in dem democratization and human rights promotion if we want the results of our work to be sustainable. Mm, absolutely. Um, and so if I can ask both of you, maybe um, Ulrike, you can answer first and then Anna. Where do you see the gaps uh, in the environment and peace policy agenda moving forward? Where should governments be prioritizing their efforts in the coming months and years? Well, that's a, that's a big question, but I, I'll try to... Well, first of all, I think the escalating biodiversity loss is, is leading to ecosystems not being able to deliver basic services like food and water and putting stress on already vulnerable groups and also leading to tensions and conflicts. There we have a lot more to do to address that. And I don't know but if you heard, but the extractive industries are responsible for half of the world's carbon emissions and more than 80% of biodiversity loss. I think uh, resources are being extracted from the planet three times faster than 1970s. And that in itself is, I think, a real cause for conflict and, and needs to be addressed. And then I think we need to work more with climate aspects in fragile and conflict contexts because people in these contexts are affected the most and have very small opportunities, for example, to adapt to a changing climate. And we also need to address and be able to see where environment, climate and conflict aspects have a greater risk of reinforcing each other. And uh, Also to continue to work with climate adaptation and disaster risk reduction and also access to renewable energy. And I think we, which in 
its turn can have positive impact on peacekeeping. And also to have an integrated approach to challenges that people in poverty face uh, in reality on the ground. And there are different layers, I think, of risk and vulnerability that, that poor people and communities face. And we need to understand that, I think, to, to move ahead and, and just address the gaps that you, you mentioned. And Anna, from your side? Yeah, talking about uh, risks that, that local communities face, uh, the last decade has shown a, a trend of shrinking democratic space for civil society actors. Uh, the situation for human and environmental rights defenders has worsened, and the number of people killed has increased in recent years. Uh, many were working to defend land and indigenous and environmental rights. Uh, usually in the context of mega projects, extractive industry, and big business. And these situations are often linked to the growing pressure on land, forests, or minerals, and the conflicting interests between individuals, local and national elites, regulators, and investors. Um, to speak up and try to shape public opinion, even in the defense of environment, can run against powerful interests, and that may in turn seriously threaten and individual security. In that sense, it is about human security as well. So, so thank you for outlining that. It's a really ambitious agenda and a really urgent one. And to conclude, I just wanted to ask if you have any advice for our listeners about what we can all do to ensure that the right decisions are made by our governments, by the international community, so that we can stop the degradation, the loss of biodiversity, address climate change, and really promote peace. I said before that I, I still I, I think we still work too much in, in silos, but that there are also efforts now to work, work more across thematic areas and sectors. And I think that is important. Um, in peace building, I think there is still a certain tendency to underestimate environmentalists and economic factors in conflict analyses and therefore also in programming. So control over natural resources are are often part of peace agreements, but that does not mean that environmental concerns have been taken into account. Uh, we need to include the environment perspective more in peace building and vice versa. Uh, we need to integrate conflict sensitivity in our strategies to respond to climate change uh, or other environmental uh, goals and challenges. Yeah, I, I could just agree on what Anna said there. I think that that's really the way ahead to to try to uh, come together and join forces. We have we sit with so much knowledge in our our different respective areas of, of work, and and it's just to to come together and see seek the best solutions with that uh, joint knowledge we have from from different expertise and building knowledge, and also raise our voices. I think and. Uh, one one thing we haven't talked about is the agenda 2030 and that work, which is also one way of of trying to to move things forward and not working in silos. That's the whole I idea of of working with all the sustainable development goals. Uh, but then also, I think uh, we could uh, also as development in development cooperation just also support programs with a broader approach, trying to also reach both climate environment benefits but uh, but peace and and address peace and, and also conflict as well in in the what we support um, so and, and just final thing is I think also what we can use and that I saw when I was in Colombia um, a year back or so is that we we can really use global capacities and multilaterals agreements and so forth. To, to push things forward on a local level when the government maybe is not so um, want to promote certain things. Uh, we have those uh, also multilateral agreements and, and global capacities to actually use f to move the agenda forward. So thank you very much, uh, Anna and Ulrika, and also to Hassan. And indeed, thank you to all of our guests over the course of this podcast. We seem to be in a moment in time where there is broader public awareness of how much we've damaged nature. And we're starting to see how this is in turn damaging our health, our politics, and the very fabric of our societies. But we've also heard from our guests about some of the concrete paths where our efforts as conservationists, environmentalists, and peace builders could reinforce each other from the very local level up to global policies. So we hope that we've inspired you to make these links from within your own area of work. 
If you're interested in getting engaged or knowing more about the environment and peace as a field, you can go to the website of the Environmental Peacebuilding Association on environmentalpeacebuilding.org. The website hosts a wide range of publications and provides information about upcoming events, opportunities for collaboration, and the activities of this association itself. The podcast will continue to be available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or your favorite podcast platform. It has been a collaboration with Conservation International, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, or IUCN, Peace Nexus Foundation, and the Worldwide Fund for Nature, Germany, and produced by Impact with Joy. Thank you for listening.